Archer is, in my opinion, one of the best made shows on television. Its humor is just so incredibly layered, including your usual kind of jokes that are funny at face value, and also ones that are in there for those who are really paying attention. So they'll have a poop joke, and then make reference to some old-timey scientist within a few seconds of each other. And both lines will be absolutely hilarious. Obviously though, this video is going to be focused on the more obscure the harder to catch little details and jokes that you might not have noticed. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Anyone who has watched an episode of Archer is probably just as confused about when the show takes place as pretty much everyone else is, and for a good reason. The spy thriller genre was easily at its height during the Cold War, and as such, the show definitely plays with that sort of geopolitical situation almost constantly, which should realistically place the show squarely in either the 60s or 70s, perhaps even the 80s at the latest. However, a lot of things have been brought up that make that basically impossible. References to pop culture and the appearance of technology being a major thing that fans often point to. And this was largely done on purpose by the show's creators. Adam Reed admitted in interviews that the show isn't actually set in a realistic time on purpose, as it allowed them to basically do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted to. Want to have a plot involving a Soviet-made, hyper-advanced robot falling in love with our protagonist? Go for it. Want to have everyone running around dressed like they're auditioning for a part in Mad Men? Go ahead and do that as well. Whatever fits the narrative the writers are trying to tell each week. Heck, in the first episode alone, we see old school computers that take up an entire room, vintage cars and weapons, and Lana on a cell phone. None of this makes sense because who cares? Just enjoy the jokes. So the next time you hear fans of the show debating when it takes place, just tell them that Adam Reed says that they're all wrong. Out of all of the incredibly funny characters within Archer, Pam is probably the one that I find to be the most consistently funny. Pretty much everything that she says and does is solid gold. But one of the best jokes involving Pam isn't one that she actually speaks out loud. In the 10th episode of season two, we found out a bit more about Pam, including the fact that she has a giant block of text tattooed on her back. That text is the third stanza of a Lord Byron poem known as the destruction of Senatorip, which I'm sure I mispronounced Pronounced, but I did my best. Because who needs to have any plain old back tattoo, like a dragon or some cool angel wings or something, when you can just have part of a poem that goes just that hard? Seriously, read the poem, it's, it's intense. Archer's ever loyal butler, Woodhouse, is almost always the butt end of the joke whenever he's around. But did you ever take a second to consider why Woodhouse is named Woodhouse to begin with? Well, his name is actually a reference to author P.G. Wodehouse, who is perhaps best known for their Jeeves series of stories, which followed the misadventures of a young British aristocrat named Bertram Wooster and his servant Jeeves, who more often than not winds up serving as the deus ex machina, helping Bertram get out of pretty much any sticky situation that he finds himself in. So one butler being a reference to another. Though sadly, as much as Woodhouse tries to help Archer, just like Jeeves did for Bertram, it doesn't usually work out quite the same way, usually due to Archer's own arrogance or just plain old stupidity. Archer is a world-class drunk, which makes sense, considering just how much time he spends drinking. So naturally, he's also pretty used to dealing with massive hangovers. In season three, during the episode Crossing Over, we saw one of his key strategies in dealing with hangovers that being an entire pitcher of Bloody Marys. And it must work for him, as he had the wherewithal to quote an old British theologian known as Jonathan Edwards, specifically for the line, for I am a sinner in the hands of an angry God, which references Edwards 1741 work, Sermon on the Danger of the Unconverted. Usually when I'm hungover, I just go get a McDonald's breakfast, as it's the greasiest thing known to man, and then spend the rest of the day lying in bed wishing I was dead. But you know what? I guess if quoting old sermons works for Archer, good for him. Ray is certainly flamboyant, to say the least. So naturally, when he revealed that he had two M1911 pistols in the 13th episode of season two, they were, of course, intricately engraved and featuring pearl handles. They actually look really sweet, I sorta of want one. Because America. While no serious attention was drawn to it in the episode, we can also see that the two guns are apparently named, having Liza and Barbara written on them. These two names are of course meant as references to Barbara Streisand and Liza Minnelli, two actresses who were both famous for their own over-the-top and flamboyant personalities. Definitely fitting for a pair of pistols belonging to someone like Ray. 
The theme seasons of Archer were a nice change of pace from the typical spy stuff that the earlier seasons got up to. And they also gave us the opportunity to see the characters we already knew in some relatively fresh situations. One example of this was Cheryl Tunt becoming Charlotte Vandertunt in season eight. Now throughout the show, the Tunt family itself has always been used as a parody of dynastic families with a crap ton of money. But come season eight, the show started referencing one specific family that being the Vanderbilts, who made their money in the railroad business, quickly becoming one of the wealthiest families in American history. And they are still around, by the way. This isn't like some families that got super, super rich at the turn of the century and then eventually disappeared. The Vanderbilt family, still going strong. Everyone loves dogs. I think it's pretty much a universal thing. Even people who say they don't like dogs, secretly, deep down, like dogs. So when we met Kazakh the Mastiff in the season four episode where Archer was sent to Morocco to rescue the little pooch, everyone who saw it was probably immediately on board. To make this episode all the more awesome though, it also contains a reference to a Kurt Vonnegut novel, specifically The Sirens of Titan, which featured a spacefaring dog named Kazakh. To keep the dog theme going, the episode's title, Un Chien Tangerine, is a reference to the film Un Chien Andalou, which means an Andalusian dog. In the very same episode that we caught a glimpse of Pam's impressive back tat, we also learned that Cheryl owned an exotic and all around hard to handle pet, an ocelot named Babu. Now that name is definitely an interesting choice, and you would be forgiven if you assumed that it was just some random name that the writers decided to go with because it was funny hearing H. John Benjamin shout it out dramatically. And I mean, it is. But the name is actually a reference to an ocelot owned by famous surrealist painter Salvador Dali. No idea if his ocelot peed and pooped on everything like Cheryl's cat does, but you know, it honestly wouldn't surprise me. Hot tip, by the way, if you're looking for an exotic pet, don't go with an ocelot. Actually, you know what? Just don't go with big cats in general. It's borderline animal abuse. That's like Meowschwitz in there. Many of the hard to spot jokes within Archer actually have ties to literature. For example, in the season one episode Scorpio, as the extravagant arms dealer started coming on to Archer and Lana, he asked Archer to make sure to bring chocolate to his room so they could partake in, let's say some rather adult activities. In response to this command, Archer simply replied, I would prefer not to. This line is in reference to Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, who would often say the exact same line when asked to do something rather untowards or unsavory. Of course, Bartleby was never asked to do what Archer and Lana wound up doing, which might just be more vile than the things that he used that line to deny, so points to Archer on this one. Citizen Kane is often referenced to by film buffs as one of, if not the, best films ever made. And honestly, it's hard to argue with them. The movie is really good. Look at me, spitting only the hottest takes. Hey everyone, Citizen Kane is good. Everyone pay attention to me, ha ha ha. What am I doing with my life? Anyways, in the season eight episode, Lady Fingers, we get a light reference to the classic movie with a parody of the title character, Xanadu Home. It's not much, but it's there. A more solid cinematic connection within season eight is one that references the 1941 classic, The Maltese Falcon, an old school noir film starring the legendary Humphrey Bogart. Obviously, for anyone who has actually seen the film, the eighth season shares a basic plot premise, with both dealing with an investigation into the death of a partner evolving into a much bigger ordeal. The more blatant connection that you really wouldn't have caught if you hadn't just recently watched Maltese Falcon before watching this season is the fact that the layout and interior design of Archer and Woodhouse's office is lifted almost entirely from the office belonging to Bogart's character in the movie. I guess if you're gonna pay homage to any noir film, the Maltese Falcon is probably the one you should go with. Gold digger is a fairly common insult that people tend to throw around when talking about women who marry men for their money. It's archaic and has some very old origins that are actually referenced by Archer to a degree. At one point in season eight, Archer says to Lana, 1933 called, they want their gold digger back. This is in reference to the largely forgotten film Gold Diggers of 1933, which itself was an adaptation of the stage play, The Gold Diggers. I know that Archer often includes some pretty deep cut references from time to time, but that right there might just be the deepest. Cyril Figgis is 
as expected, a bit of a nerd. But the full breadth of his nerdiness is only really known by those who caught this one obscure reference. While it was originally used by Archer, the codename of Chet Manley is probably the most commonly used codename of Cyril while undercover. This name is actually from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic. It was the name of the boy who dropped the four baby turtles into the sewer, where they met up with an old rat and became mutated by a gross, glowing goo, becoming the turtles that we all know and love. I think it's a pretty safe bet that Cyril got the reference himself, and that is why he kept on using it. The fact that it's also one of the most Giga Chad sounding names in the history of fiction probably doesn't hurt either. Sterling Archer's voice actor, H. John Benjamin, is also the star of yet another successful animated series. That of course being Bob's Burgers, which is directly referenced in the fourth season episode, Fugue and Riffs. However, Benjamin is not the only member of the Bob's Burgers cast to make an appearance on the show. Kristen Stahl and Eugene Merman, who voice Louise and Eugene respectively, both appear in the fourth season episode, Sea Tunt, where Merman plays Cheryl's brother Cecil and Shaw voices his girlfriend Tiffy. Somewhat ironically, despite appearing in the same season as the episode in which their Bob's Burgers characters appeared, the actors did not voice them in that episode, as the characters never spoke. Let's stick with the Bob's Burgers reference for a minute and talk about the burger puns that are present in that sequence. On the actual show, Bob often creates special burgers for his menu that he names some sort of pun. And this tradition continues on into Archer as well. The burger written on the board is called the Thomas Elphinstone Hambledurger, which is in reference to Thomas Elphinstone Hambledon, the protagonist of a famous series of spy novels. Eventually, Archer suggests creating a burger known as the Emile Gargonzola with Jacques Cumbers, which is a reference to Emile Zola and his famous letter Jacques, which was written and published in 1898 in order to publicly accuse the French government of anti-Semitism. So you you know, fun stuff. In the season seven episode titled The Handoff, we got to see Cheryl once again up to some serious shenanigans. In this particular case, she was attempting to burn a cashier's check. Cyril, being one of the more rational voices amongst the Archer cast, cautioned against it as the check might have fingerprints on it that they could use. Cheryl, despite often being presented as a ditzy airhead, fired back with the rather obscure retort, saying, well, who am I, Alphonse Bertillon? Bertillon was a 19th century French police investigator who pioneered the use of anthropometry, or the identification of suspects by certain physical measurements. This system proved to be revolutionary for quite a while, until fingerprinting came along and supplanted it as the primary means of identifying criminals. I'm willing to bet that, unless you're someone who studied forensics in college, you probably didn't know that. And I am right there alongside you on that one. So, there's a lot of drinking in Archer. Like, a lot, a lot. So it makes sense that in every single episode, the sound of ice clinking in a glass can be heard. Even in episodes where we don't physically see a glass full of ice, the sound is still mixed into the soundscape of the show somewhere. It's basically an audio version of the Superman Easter egg from Seinfeld. You know, how every episode of Seinfeld has Superman in the episode somewhere. It's the same basic idea. Also, boom, bonus Seinfeld fact that I'm betting you weren't expecting. The zone will be one of danger? No, I mean, not if you'd say the thing dip. Forget it, never mind. Archer has a ton of reoccurring jokes that he makes at Lana's expense. We all know the danger zone bit, that honestly I feel like the show kind of ran into the ground, but one that wasn't quite as overdone was Archer's jokes about Lana's relatively large hands, which at one point he refers to as being Johnny Benchian. This is in reference to Johnny Bench, a Hall of Fame catcher who played for the Cincinnati Reds from 1967 to 1983. Famously, Bench was noted to have rather large fingers, much like Lana apparently does. Archer also used a reference to Bench in the first episode, though in that instance he was pretty much comparing his mother's... You know what, I'm just gonna stop and move on. I don't need to be demonetized any more than we probably already are. Here's a detail that wasn't actually originally seen in the show. In the tie-in book, How to Archer, it was revealed that Dr. Krieger's first name is Algernop, a fact that was later confirmed when a group of aliens referred to him as such after reading his mind. Them referring to him by that name is also taken by fans as proof that he is indeed the original Krieger, and not one of the clones that we saw in season six of the show, an episode in which some fans have theorized that he was actually replaced. Archer is a pretty straightforward title for a show about a super spy named Sterling Archer. However, that wasn't always the title. In fact, originally the show was going to be called Duchess, which fans will recognize as one of Archer's official codenames, and also the name of his mother's favorite dog. 
and also my code name during Humans vs. Zombies back in college. In fact, Duchess was the title for the show for so long that it wasn't until the animators were nearly done animating the introduction for the show that the final title was settled upon. Personally, I think they made the right choice. Hey there everybody, I'm John Algets. I made this video and I want to know what you think. What are some of your favorite hidden details and easter eggs within Archer? Any that I missed that you want me to talk about in a future video? Let me know in the comments below or go ahead and shoot me a response over on Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe to Screen Rant for more great videos just like this in the future.